Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Patrick Flynn, and welcome to this morning's A Different Perspective. I am so excited that you guys are with us today. We have an absolutely incredible show for you. Everything from a great uh, testimonial video from Dr. Jason, the wonderful stories, the wonderful stories that our team is putting out, to uh, once again, packed by popular demand, and I promise it's going to be the last one for a little bit. Uh, we're going to do a question and answer again. Um, because uh, every time we do one, it seems like that we get uh, thousands and literally thousands of emails and Facebook mo posts and messages and Instagram messages. So um, I had so many people reach out and say, Doc, I watch your show every week. Um, could you possibly get my question on there? So once again, but we, I do have a couple topics that I want to cover over the next couple weeks. So we're going to do one last Q&A. Uh, so if you do have a question during the time, uh, go to AskDrPatrick at TheWellnessWay.com or what happens is we have our wonderful interns uh, here that are on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram that if you do post a question there that we will um, actually get it up and try to cover it yet today. Uh, but before we get started, they did not know this was going to happen. So hopefully Colin, Dr. Colin and Lena have done their hair already. So we're going to bring them up here so they can say hi to everybody. They interned in one of our amazing offices, but they are docs and they're getting ready to open in the fall in the Florida area. So they're each going to stand one side of me and see these pretty faces here. And um, so uh, they should be able to hear you. So why don't you guys say, introduce yourself and just uh, say hi to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Morning. Hi, I'm Lena. And Lena, hold up your left hand. They're also now engaged. <laughs> so two wonderful, amazing docs that will be in our, in the Florida area. It's going to be fantastic. So they're going down by Ron DeSantis, which is kind of a great state and stuff like that. Oh, so yeah. these, uh, see these two beautiful people that uh, not only are just recent docs and graduated, you graduated what, June or May? In February. Oh, February. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> it's been that long. There. I've known you guys that long already. So you'll see them have a wonderful office uh, on our clinics here pretty soon. So thanks, guys. Excited having Thank you guys you. there. So another beautiful clinic that will be open. They're going to go sit down. They'll be watching the Facebook and YouTube. So as we do through questions that way. So, yes. So everybody, welcome uh, these guys to our Wellness Way team. Uh, because, like I said, you're going to see another office pop up in Florida uh, giving great care. Uh, they, they trained, now they're here actually training for a couple more weeks. And the nice thing is they're going to be a wonderful uh, husband-wife team down in one of our awesome clinics in Florida. So you'll be able to see these great people. And they're here training, working hard. And it's kind of funny because uh, uh, they even said, oh, Doc, we barely saw you this week. I'm like, yep, because we are always working, always running, doing amazing things. Always remember this, the show, um, I, was, I was so um, blown away last week because sitting in our uh, video meeting, and our marketing manager looked at me and said, you know, we had 19,000 hits on the website within a very short time during the show. I'm like, 19,000? I'm like, holy crap, that's a lot of people jumping on from all over that way. So it was, it was kind of a neat statistic that our stats keep coming up. But, you know, the thing is, it's all about what we have when it comes to our clinics. But that being said, um, how you can consistently follow us and see what's going on and see when their office opens up and everything like that is we have a newsletter. Remember, it's free. So you can subscribe to it. You can see the video right here. Just get on there, click on there, put your email in. There's multiple things you can do. And on top of it, if you do happen to get our newsletter, you can actually sign up. You can see right here, you'll see that we have our articles that come out every single week that our investigative journalists, it's kind of great because right outside where I sit every day, we have our wonderful investigative journalists of, of uh, Aaron and Betsy sitting right out there. I get to walk out there. They ask questions constantly. Um, we are coming up with the greatest articles that exist out there. So these guys, you can saw from the video before, you can actually go there and you can also do it. You can see, for example, that you know, pop on, get our newsletter. You can also see this, which is very important to me, is when you do go to the Wellness Way website, you can actually see our Find a Clinic. As you can see, eventually you'll see Dr. Colm, Dr. Lena's uh, uh, clinic on there. You'll be able to just click on there, and they're all over. That's the proud part of the Wellness Way. I am so ecstatic about our wonderful media team, our marketing team, all the things that we do to get our message out there. But really what it comes down to, the majority of our audience, the majority of people that find us, uh, walk into one of our clinics. So if you do want to know where there is a clinic, uh, they're popping up uh, everywhere. Like I said, I'm hoping one day that uh, the Wellness Way logo is actually just as recognizable as the Starbucks logo, you know? And I will tell you this, as long as I'm alive, I'll work really hard for that to happen. Now, the easiest way to understand, let's say that you're part of the Wellness Way already, or let's say that you're interested in it, do me a favor. One thing that's very important that sets the basis uh, for what we stand for is our inflammation talks. Uh, I travel all over and I still speak, but believe it or not, I don't do inflammation talks. 
All of our wonderful docs do it. Dr. Colin Lee are trained to do it. Our interns are trained to do it. All of our docs in every clinic. So when you saw Find a Clinic, you can actually uh, go and see an inflammation talk. And we have a nice video to show you to give you an idea what it is. And here it is. Learn how inflammation is at the center of sickness and what steps you can make to take control of your health. Visit thewellnessway.com and click on Find a Clinic tab. Select a clinic near you and then click Attend an Event. We provide the essential guidance to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles through a combination of testing, individual plans, and one-on-one -on -one guidance to restore your body to total wellness. We hope by attending these events that you can take back control of your own body for a healthier future. So if you want to know more about what our care is and what we do, Information Talk by any of the practitioners across the world is a great place to go. Now, speaking of that, great places to go, I can honestly tell you guys, um, I am absolutely clueless when it comes to media. I really am. I don't actually spend that much time on media. When people say, Doc, do you ever jump on TikTok? Do you ever jump on Instagram? Not really. I actually jump on there just to get our questions. So once again, some of you guys uh, um, are on Instagram right now, watch certain things, but you can see TikTok right here. Our TikTok is going crazy. It really is. I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, next thing you know, did a video, a million people watched it. It's kind of neat. I was like, all right, kind of cool. Got a ton of questions for Oliver. If you're on TikTok, go there. You can see it's just under Dr. Patrick Flynn, but also you'll see all the docs. So if you are in your local area with your local wellness way, you will see that there is a TikTok presentation, TikTok uh, account for almost every office across the world. And then they will post out videos and things like that so you can stay uh, a little bit more informed in your local area. So find your local wellness way and check out their TikTok, check out their Instagram. Uh, but we will consistently post out. And for you guys that watch me all the time, um, I'm always going to push the envelope a little bit more. I get a little more sassy on my videos and stuff like that. So that's why I think I get blocked so much on everything. I'm always flagged. But that's kind of cool, Dr. Jordan, which once again, I got to say this, uh, Dr. Jordan, uh, who's over in our Claire office, uh, congratulations. He just had a, well, not he, <laughs> Jenna, him and his beautiful wife, Jenna, just had uh, a beautiful baby. Um, congratulations. We love you guys. Uh, can't wait to hold that beautiful baby girl. It's exciting. Uh, congratulations, guys. Uh, that being said, uh, when we actually have the things that happen to Wellsway, uh, the stories that happen inside, it's absolutely fantastic. It's heartwarming. Um, it's it's the, the beautiful things from testimonial to watch people's lives happen, to help people get fertile, to everything like that is very, very emotional. And the one thing that we started doing to get you guys to have a concept of what we see every day, our team has put together Wellness Way stories. These are actually people uh, that have had the experience from all things. And you saw, you know, uh, the, the guy that Dr. Sam took care of. You saw Haley last week. Um, Dr. Jason has a wonderful um, story to share with you guys. It's a heart-wrenching story. And the nice thing is you, you only get the, you know, so many minute clip of it. But the nice thing is the majority of these people, when they're shooting a video, I get to shake their hand and listen to their story. Or Haley, I was more involved with that care. So therefore, I get to be a part of it. And uh, it's quite emotional. And the thing that I am so excited when these doctors and interns come, this is their life going forward that they get to see things like this. So let's watch uh, a great heartwarming video uh, with Dr. Jason and a person that had a different perspective and then got the clinical results they couldn't get anywhere else. Hey everyone, Dr. Jason from The Wellness Way in Green Bay. I specialize in things like weight loss and blood sugar and cholesterol and diabetes. But today, it's not about me about a patient of mine named Rob. And Rob came in, he was on a couple different medications, not feeling good, right? He wanted to feel healthier. Trying to get out of him what was going on was kind of tough, because as you'll see, he's kind of a real super chill, laid back kind of guy. And it was through the testing that we've done through here, the Wellness Way, that we've kind of discovered a couple of things that were going on and kind of throwing his body off. As we were working through the process, he started to experience some changes that were kind of drastic, but what I'm gonna do is let him tell his story so you can see kind of what he's gone through with his Wellness Way journey. So for a living, I'm uh, the Associate Executive Director at St. John's Homeless Shelter here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. My work at the shelter has allowed me the opportunity to meet the needs of others. It allows me the opportunity to serve and to put them ahead of myself. Uh, it's very um, easy to focus on oneself, 
But when you actually are out there doing the things that you do every day to help the needs of others that are um, a lot less fortunate than, than I am and for the majority of the people, it's a very rewarding experience. I'd had issues with high liver numbers, um, you know, uh, fatty liver disease, and also thyroid issues. Two of my daughter-in-laws had been patients or are patients of the Wellness Way. Uh, one of my daughter-in-laws had um, lost uh, quite a bit of weight. Her hormones and things that were going on with her actually got better. Uh, she felt a lot better. And so I thought, well, I mean, if it worked for both of them, then what are the chances that it may not work for me? So I thought I would give it a try. Dr. Jason has become uh, obviously a, a friend and a confidant in, in health issues. He's been able to help me through um, issues with diet and exercise and um, you know things like that that have helped me out uh, incredibly. I think the biggest thing that I found out was that a lot of the things that I was eating affected my internal organs and the things that were going on inside. When I found out what my allergies were and the things that I started eliminating, my health just improved. I, I would say that by eating the right way, by eating the right things, taking the supplements, doing the things that Dr. Jason had uh, you know, asked me to do, I was able to lose weight that I didn't really think that I was overweight. My ideal weight was, you know, I didn't think was ever attainable and now I'm below my ideal weight and, and close to my um, you know, body mass index that I needed to be at. It takes work, it takes dedication, it takes the desire to get better each and every day. Uh, as you start to see your body change, the way that you look, the way that you feel, the way that you're uh, wearing your clothes, things like that, um, that's when the, the, the self-intrinsic motivation becomes apparent. And it was, a, it was a challenge each and every day that, no, I can't have that. No, I don't want to do that. No, um, I can't do that as I go out to dinner with friends or family or whatever. Uh, it's just a, it's a mindset that's, uh, it is difficult. It is a challenge, but in the end, it's well worth it. It's very important to get your health and the issues and the concerns that you have uh, under control right now, not next month or next year or when I feel like it or when I have the money. So for today, you know, as I sit here and, and as I think about the, you know, like I said, the last 18 months, um, I want to encourage those that are on the fence or even thinking about being at the Wellness Way, uh, being a part of the Wellness Way, um, I would just encourage you to not delay, not wait, make the decision to do it as soon as possible because every day that you don't do this, you're putting yourself at a risk that your health may not be where it should be. Just talking about Rob a little bit because he, he does so much for other people. Uh, he works in a homeless shelter, helping so many other people that come through that are suffering. And for us to be able to kind of give that back to him, help him become a healthier person and kind of teach him some things that he's able to take care of himself better. So now he can take care of all those other people that he helps on a daily basis. Just makes everything just so worthwhile. Our entire goal here is health restoration. And what that means is we go on a path with you. We're your guide. We walk with you as your body starts to heal, as you take control of your health. That's really our goal, is to make sure that you know how to take care of your health so you're not reliant on other people. Wellness Way is a global company. We have doctors all over the country, even in other countries like Ireland. So if you know somebody like Rob, if you know somebody that can benefit from taking control of their health, you can find us. Thank you, Dr. Jason, for just an amazing story. And the things that you shared, I can honestly tell you, for a lot of you guys that don't know, Dr. Jason is my longest practicing doc with me. Um, we were kids, we were in our 20s when we got together and I was only short time practice after he graduated and we've been here for a long time and, and that's why for all you guys that uh, know Dr. Jason, 
He's all heart. He's all amazing. And we, we even nicknamed him the Silver Fox. You know what I'm saying? So great guy. And all the studio starts laughing and people are here because they know. See, that's the nice thing about this. We have such a great relationship with all the people that are within the company. And Dr. Jason has been a big part of it, always will be a big part of it. And um, the clinical results that he gets brings him a, a heartwarming every single day that happens. So, yes. So thank you, Doc. Thank you for the wonderful testimonials. Thank you for w walking through with that person. And look at the results that they got. So that being said, what we're going to do now, we have the other Dr. Patrick in studio with us. We're going to move into our question and answer. All right, as I said, the other Dr. Patrick uh, that we only have in the company. Uh, good morning, man, how are you doing? Good, how are you, Doc? Doing fantastic, so let's do this. Let's start with our first question and we'll see what we go from there. All right, yeah, these are a beautiful series. I love these question and answers. And like as an intern, you know, I'm learning a whole bunch and I'm sure all the other interns are as well. So uh, it's not just even the people that are watching us that's uh, getting a lot of good info. So the first question we're going to start with, I watched one of your videos on YouTube and I didn't believe you. So I had to research myself and it blew me away. The topic was how much potassium your body needs daily. Can you explain your thoughts on it? Well, there's a couple thoughts I have on first of all. I love the first part of that question. You know, number one, I put out an idea. Number two, you didn't believe me. Number three, you wouldn't research yourself. That right there is heartwarming. You know, I can tell people to show a post, a reel, a TikTok video, everything like that is meant in, and these are my train our docs and their interns. And Dr. Patrick, when you're in practice, it's the same thing. You put something out there, but then you have the material to back it. And the cool thing is, and then if they do, as we say, if there was really fact checkers on Facebook and fact checkers on things, they would go, oh my goodness, you know, here's what we found. Um, one, I think is, there's one mineral and uh, that I teach on on a regular basis is potassium. Uh, I think it's probably the most overlooked nutrient that we need that is such at a high RDA, recommended daily ounce, and that just to hit the minimals is very difficult. It really is. Um, I can honestly tell you, uh, I personally, I personally, and even my daughters and some of that, uh, cannot hit the recommended daily allowance with our current um, foods today. And that's gonna surprise people because when you look at potassium itself, you're like, well, you know, you should be able to get in foods and things like that. No, believe it or not, my family has to supplement with it. I have to supplement with it every day because I don't eat enough potassium per day. Now, if you were to look it up, and here's the thing, the average standard person, now once again, obviously me and Dr. Patrick are different, me and Dr. Jane are different, me and Dr. Colin are different. There's gonna be different demands. And this happened recently. I got an email from a triathlete, somebody that is training for major, um, no joke, Olympics, uh, professional athlete and they were like you know doc um, I'm such a I'm, I'm such a great fitness but everything that all the trainers the doctors and everything are doing um, I end up so sore and I, it seems like my recovery is longer and no joke I said you know what happens to this I said can you can you this is gonna sound weird if you just walk upstairs what do your muscles feel like like it's and, and no joke he responded to me he said oh my goodness he goes I thought something was wrong. I, I've gone up a couple of stairs. I actually felt like a little weakness in my legs. And he goes, and I run miles and miles and miles a day. I just thought because I was fatigued out. And I said, it's really funny. Um, you're going to find out you're cardiovascularly strong with all the exercise you do. But I said, sometimes you feel like you're, you know, have a little hard time breathing. He's like, oh my goodness, how'd you know? And I said, do me a favor. Let's work on it slowly. You roughly need 4,700 milligrams per day if you just have a standard lifestyle. I said, being an athlete, you may, especially a triathlete, you probably need six or 7,000 milligrams per day. I said, can you do me a favor? Can you just take 1,000 milligrams of potassium? Just start that. Now, that's a minimal amount. I think you need a lot more, but just that. Honestly, two days later, sent me a message, and he's like, Doc, it was life-changing. And he goes, my soreness dropped dramatically. Can I increase? And I said, yes. And believe it or not, now I have on, on about 5,000 milligrams of potassium per day. Why he's still eating? Because like I said, the daily person that isn't a high-level athlete, you still need at least 4,700. And if you work out on a regular basis, you probably need more than 4,700 milligrams per day. 4,700, so 4,700 4, 0 milligrams per day. And to give you an idea, if you just look at the ratio of what you need from a vegetable standpoint, 
you would need seven to 10 cups of potassium-based vegetables per day to make that happen. If you were to get even just beet greens, so beets, you know, you have the beets, they're popping up in my garden like crazy. And if you cut off the, the greens, you know, and a lot of people throw that out, they don't realize that that is actually the highest, one of the highest foods with potassium that you can do. And, and yeah, and guys, trust me, beet greens taste like crap. <laughs> They do. They don't taste good, man. They suck. They really do. So it's not like I'm looking forward to saying, yes, I can't wait to have a bunch of beet greens today. Heck no. That's why some of the highest potassium based foods can be dramatic, uh, but it's hard to take because of the, uh, the, the flavor. Of them. Now, because they doc, but bananas have a lot of potassium. No, bananas have roughly can vary from four to 800 milligrams. And if you eat five bananas a day, your blood sugar is going to go crazy. It's going to go crazy. So you can't do it by, I would, I honestly, I wouldn't even encourage people, especially if they have any kind of liver condition to ever eat a banana. It's too much simple glucose. So therefore, when you look it up and you go 4,700 per day, and I started having an athlete take almost 5,000, it dramatically changed life. And he even said, I am performing better. My times are better just by increasing that. And he's a timed professional athlete. Now, imagine this just for those functions alone. And, and if you ever know this, this, this is what, this is how the idea of salt got to bad. If you think about it, um, we need a significant amount of sodium because you know why? There's something in the body, if you want to research it, it's called the sodium potassium pump. Every cell has a, an electronic exchange of sodium potassium. It creates electricity. So even my brain, nervous system, muscles, everything there. And that's why you can get a lot of muscle cramping with low potassium because you know why? There's significant amounts of sodium outside the cell and potassium inside the cell, and there's an exchange. It's a pump. That's how we create electricity in our body. So therefore, that's why sometimes people have low energy. It can contribute to actually having potassium being low. But here's what happens. We don't eat enough potassium. Um, then it's much easier to get salt in our diet, but sometimes crappy salt, but it's much easier to get salt in our diet. So there is an imbalance. And because there's imbalance, there's more sodium inside of a cell and sodium by nature attracts water. And then you get puffy. So if you wake up and your rings are all puffy and you can't move your stuff that way, there's some potassium deficiency there. But see, and they say, look at salt is bad. Salt is bad. Salt is bad. Really? That's like someone tell me cholesterol is bad. Your brain uses the most cholesterol every single day. Your body uses a significant amount and needs a significant amount of potassium and especially sodium per day. So how can you tell me salt is bad when it's an essential mineral that you need? Somebody tell me, you can't live, you can't even have one electrical activity in your body and your brain and your brain and nervous system run on it. So the rest of your body without salt, but you've been convinced salt's bad, cholesterol's bad. No, salt isn't bad. You're just so potassium deficient that the exchange of sodium and potassium coming in and out of a cell is deficient. So water can be retained and therefore Yes, if you just deplete your salt, you have less water, but it's not, a, it's not because you have too much salt. Most people are salt deficient. I can prove it to you that uh, people are very salt deficient. It's just that the ratio to salt to potassium is usually greater on salt, even if you eat crappy salt. So there's not enough potassium to create that balance and create the activity. So you will retain water and your blood pressure can go up. Mm -hmm. See, so what you need to do is this, is you need to dramatically increase your potassium intake. Dramatically. And guess what happens? I don't need enough. I didn't come close. I, mean, I think I took 3,000 milligrams yesterday. Why? I barely ate yesterday. I think I had a little bit of a, um, I think I actually took more supplements yesterday than I took food. I'm just being real with you. You know, it was just, I was going 100 miles an hour. Um, Actually, the way, <laughs> you know what my, you know what my first thing I ate yesterday was? Um, my beautiful daughter, Faith, was down in, uh, in Appleton, and she stopped by Happy Bellies. And so she brought me an organic cheesecake, uh, turtle cheesecake. That was the first thing. I, it, was like, it was like 4 o'clock, and I finally, I was going 100 miles an hour yesterday, and finally I grabbed, uh, it was, she sat on my desk, and she's like, Daddy, I brought you a, you know, a cheesecake. I'm like, thanks, love. I really appreciate it that way. And... And now I have a full kitchen, big huge thing here. And I sat down on my desk and all of a sudden it was sitting there looking at me. I'm like, I haven't eaten anything yet today. Ah, oh, that's okay. <laughs> so my first thing I had was cheesecake and then I had, um, then I had some chicken last night. And, but here's what happens, it's not a joke. 
the amount of potassium I consumed yesterday was minimal. I think I, I, I literally think I had a cheesecake and a chicken breast yesterday, and that was it. That was it. So then I'm like, ah, crap. I need to supplement my bad choices of my diet. And I say, oh, wait, doc, that cheesecake was organic, everything, you had good sweeteners, absolutely. I didn't say it was toxic. But my bad choices when it came to not giving my body enough nutrients what it needed for a day, I had to supplement with it. So it was just easier to, okay, a stragulus, a nettle, all the things I put in a, a nice shot glass. I was, like, I was almost like a cup, drank that down, aloe juice, uh, made sure I had my vinegar, boom, chicken breast, done. You know, Sam? And I think I took, well, there's 250 milligrams. I think I took 16 pills of um, potassium yesterday to get 4,000. See, so those are the things that you gotta look for when you actually do it. So remember, I had to supplement a ton yesterday because of my lifestyle I had for the day and what I consumed. And that's why potassium is so important, guys. Most people, I can show you beyond shadow doubt, I don't know honestly anybody that eats enough per day. Honestly, I really don't. So it's always gonna be something I'm gonna supplement with and uh, my family supplement with and people I care about supplement with because you go potassium deficient, there's a lot of problems that come from there. So especially blood pressure high blood pressure. And if you think about this, the number one reason why people go to doctors over the age of 40 is actually blood pressure. It still dominates, it really does. And here's what happens. Most people are gonna put you on a water dilating drug to try to pull water out of your system instead of actually finding out why you're retaining water in the first place. Most people are retaining water because they do have salt in their system but they're missing potassium. Holy mackerel, that was a long answer. <laughs> so. Well, to kind of go on that, like, is there any particular potassium supplement that you would recommend? Uh, like, how much potassium is too much in one day, or how much would you recommend to start? Yeah, you, you always got to start slow, just because, you know, when I say 4,700, 4, I would never want somebody to start with 4,700. You know, I would start with it. I'd actually start with even just, like, 500 milligrams and build yourself up. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're an athlete. Not only an athlete, if you work out, you know what I'm saying? You're going you're gonna to notice some muscle soreness, and just by even seeing the recovery coming back much quicker and the performance of how you work out and the strength and rehabilitation. And remember, potassium is used even for your liver for sugar metabolism. It's actually something I make sure that people take when they're doing, uh, uh, if they have fatty liver. So I would say start with, um, and no joke, go to wellnessway.com, go to shop, go to our products, go get some potassium. It's the best form. It's actually, we actually have 250 milligram pills. Most mm -hmm. things, even a good form of potassium, you can get, remember potassium you can buy anywhere. You really can. The, the, the only thing I did is I worked with our manufacturer and said, listen, everybody out there does like 50 or 99 milligrams. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I actually get this. I ran out of, I ran out of um, potassium when I was in, when I was in um, Oahu. And I don't have an office there. I have an office in Maui, so I couldn't run to the office really quick and get it. So, but I was going there in about a week. But what happened is I ran out of it and I went to the health food store, which actually they had a great form of potassium there and they only had 50 milligram pills. Man, I bought like four bottles because there's only like you know, 50 pills in there, which I consumed almost a bottle a day mm -hmm. just, be, just because of not having some and giving them to the girls and some of that. So, yep, that's the best way to start. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, my mission is to find a cure for the reason that I got breast cancer and I'm working to always stay healthy. Um, <clears throat> I've gone and thrown uh, I've gone through a few rounds of chemo, uh, one of four so far, mm -hmm. and have been all against my better judgment. Uh, I truly believe that there's got to be a better way out there, but unfortunately, this is how it's supposed to be with the doctors at Stanford and uh, UC, uh, UCSF. Okay. Um, so she would really like an opportunity to speak with you on getting a better outcome for the, the uh, long term. Okay. Now, if you think of it this way, let me give you a couple of perspectives to think about. I've always said this. You ever think about man, they kind of try to mimic what the body does. For example, let's look at this. What does chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery do? Well, they say with well, doc, it tries to kill the cancer. Well, guess what? We already have things that kill cancers. You know, we have our own immune system. They're just trying to replicate what the immune system is doing. So my first perspective is, guess what happens? We gotta look at, there has to be some immune deficiency. If you look at it this way, you know, people even say, well, doc, you know, breast cancer can be, you know, estrogen um, triggered. Absolutely. But do you know how many women actually have high estrogens? 90% of women. 90% of women do not get breast cancer. But the idea is this. Is there some, usually some immune deficiency, some immune problem going on? So therefore, that's where I would start. You can actually, even with the doctors that you do, here, watch this. 
if she's going through chemotherapy, she's already getting some testing done and they're testing a general aspect of her immune system because if the chemotherapy kills it off so mad, they, she can't even recover from chemotherapy and they could die and they gotta stop treatment. See, so therefore, start investigating the immune system. But if it is breast cancer, you have to actually also look at the hormone component. Mm. And I guarantee that that practitioners that she's seeing at Stanford or the medical school, they're not gonna measure all of her estrogens and her progesterone and things like that. So she, and the reason why I say estrogens is because if they're lucky, they may measure estradiol or estrone, but that, that, that always isn't the most contributing estrogen for breast cancer. It's actually not. Actually, four hydroxyesterone and estradiol are. And most women are going, what are those? I'm like, those are hormones that can actually cause some DNA damage of the mitochondria and actually trigger breast cancer. So I'd actually make sure that a person got a Dutch test done, got actually some blood work that's called our thyroid hormones, now remember, if you do have a question right now, you can email me at askdrpatrick at thelonesway.com. I have it up right here. Or even if you have, say, doc, and I'll email this person, say, even if they do have uh, uh, breast cancer lab and you wanna know what lab work to do, see, I can tell you what lab work to do. I can't tell you what to do with your breast cancer. And, I, and remember, she said one of four. I'll never, I'll never tell people what to do um, with as far as to take chemotherapy ration. I can give them an idea what I believe, because remember, we don't give medical advice, but sometimes you have to find out if you have fast growing or if it's slow growing, because there are some cancers that grow so slow, and if a person's 60 years old, they have more chance of dying of old age than they do of cancer, just because it's that slow growing. There's people that have tumors for years and never knew they have them, and it's not even growing, it doesn't even cause a problem. But that being said, you know, I would actually start with getting some immune testing done and getting some hormone testing done why you're still going through chemotherapy, because it'll help you not only recover, but see if you do survive the aspect of their treatment and breast cancer is reduced. You don't want to come in back, and those are the best ways to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this next one's going to relate to a lot of people, especially uh, on the financial aspect. Okay. So Dr. Flynn, I have type 2 diabetes and hypothyroidism. I only have enough finances to address one of them at a time. Which would you approach first? Okay. Here, that actually comes up a lot. You see that with a lot of patients. Um, I mean this sincerely, and I'm probably getting some flack on this, <laughs> okay? I might get some flack uh, from just people in general and practitioners and some of that, not ours, because they understand this. If you have a blood sugar problem, don't even go to a doctor. Now let me explain. Start reducing all of your simple sugars, get rid of your grains, get rid of your simple fruits, get rid of the, the things that, have, that contribute to your blood sugar, get your blood sugar down, now go to the now go to it because here's what happens i can tell you right now that that person i don't know if it's male or female is it male or female doc do we know uh i don't know no. okay um well male or female doesn't matter but if you have high blood sugar that can actually contribute dramatically to hypothyroidism so if you want to deal with your hypothyroidism and you don't deal with the blood sugar i will, i can't even help you my practitioners can't help you you need to get your blood sugar down. If there's one thing that's universal right now that I can honestly say with probably, and I could even ask our docs right here as they're with patients, I'd probably say 99% of people have to drop their sugar intake, have to, because it's contributing to a lot of the conditions that they're doing, all these metabolic diseases. So I would say, I wouldn't even worry about finances of testing yet. If you do have type two diabetes, I would, I'd actually more apt for you to take some gymnema, use your money with that, work extremely important on getting to your, move more towards a, you know, organ meat. I don't want to say the, the word just because it's going to draw, it's, people are going to take it out of context, more of a carnivore type diet. <laughs> you know, so don't start eating just a ton of bacon today. You know what I'm saying? Because my idea of carnivore diet is you better have a bunch of organ meats first. And then some very fermented vegetables your very high fiber fruits, for example, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries. I honestly, believe it or not, those are about the only three fruits I consume. Blackberries are by far my favorite. Blueberries are number two. Raspberries, just love those things. But they're such a high fiber content. And then, obviously you guys know I love sauerkraut. So if you actually got a person to, to have some fermented vegetables like sauerkraut and some other ones, and actually have some organ meats and some muscle meats, and actually have those kind of fruits, their blood sugar would drop dramatically. Now go and spend your money, and actually if you throw in some gymnema, 
I will tell you this. I would, I, I would never want to tell a person to supplement first, but I would say Jim Nema because it's going to reduce your ability to absorb sugar. It's going to help your pancreas produce better insulin. It's going to make you more apt to deal with insulin resistance. So I'd say get some Jim Nema. Actually, I, was, I emailed. I was actually, um, after a wonderful day yesterday, um, Felicity wanted to watch a little bit of a movie. So I sat down and we were snuggling in. And then, of course, you know, I throw my laptop. But I, I can't just sit and just do one thing. If I got to do a movie, I got to type on some emails. And so this one person I was talking about, I'm like, okay, listen, you know, you have type 2 diabetes. I would actually start with some gymnema that way. And all of a sudden, she responded back. She goes, oh, my goodness. I looked up to gymnema. The term is called destroyer of sugar. Why didn't my doctor tell me about this? Well, no different than I will not tell you about metformin because you know why? That's not my world. I'm not going to tell you about a medication because it's not my world. I don't give medical advice. They're going to tell you about metformin because their world. I'm going to tell you about Genema. I'm going to tell you about Golden Seal. Now, be careful on Golden Seal because you can only take that for a short time. But those are the things. That's our world. So work on your blood sugar first and then go see a doctor. And then I would say from that standpoint, get a thyroid with hormone panel done. It's just blood work. It can be done anywhere. And no joke, and if you don't know what that is, just email me at askdrpatrick.com and just request a thyroid and hormone panel. Um, and then I could send you a split work. It could be done by any lab across the world. Uh, that's the nice thing about labs are everywhere. It doesn't matter what country you're in. doesn't matter if you're you know, a metric system or not. I remember, if you're United States, you can go anywhere. So that would be my advice when it came to those two things. Awesome. Yeah, so one that uh, I feel like will probably relate to the previous questions. Uh, I currently have high blood pressure. It's controlled by meds. How do I get to the point where I can stop taking these meds? Um, number one, you have to have a doctor uh, because remember, uh, you have to have a doc that can actually work with you to pull them off. And they're on. a person can stop any medication you want. I always love people say, I can't stop taking medication. My doctor would be mad. Uh, your doctor doesn't own your body. Do you say I'm? I love how they're scared to tell their doctor that they want to get off a of medication or something like going, they don't own you. This slavery stopped a long time ago, okay? <laughs> and I know it's dramatic me saying that, but no joke. The, what you guys saw that happen with COVID over the last two years, people actually demanding what people do. I'm like, be careful, docs, the way you talk to people. Um, but that being said, it's find a doc that's going to be willing to do it. But you got to remember, when you look at that potassium-sodium ratio that way, you're going to find out that a lot of our blood pressure is caused by major deficiencies and therefore getting potassium and having the other things and bringing your systemic inflammation down, getting your sodium potassium balance back is dramatic. And then what's gonna happen is this, when you start doing the right things, your doctor is going to have to take you off the medication because here's what happens. I have awesome blood pressure. I think mine's at 115 over 78, okay? If I took those medications, what do you think would happen to my blood pressure? It would go down, it'd make me sick. See, so when a person starts recovering, they're going to have their blood pressure by nature go back to normal, but if they're taking medication, it's gonna to go too low. One of the number one symptoms of low blood pressure is actually dizziness. It's actually dizziness. So what we'll do is I'll say, listen, when I was taking care of patients full time, I said, listen, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna start taking care of you. You may wake up, be dizzy, things like that. Get to your doctor right away, have your blood pressure taken, and let, them, and let me know what their advice was. And 99% of the time, there's only a very few times that the doctor said, no, you can't get off it. I'm like, find another doctor. Find another doctor. Any doctor tells you, okay, without proof of permanent damage, that you can't get off medication, they're lying to you. They're actually lying to you. So, yep, that's what I do. Okay, so the next question is from Jessica. Okay. Uh, I watched your post on Facebook and Instagram. My husband is a type 1 diabetic and is struggling with rosacea for the past four years. All the doctors tell him it's unexplainable and the only way to help is to stay on antibiotics for the... Uh, for keeping the, the disease at bay. Okay. Uh, to try to avoid all the triggers, and although you know the triggers can be wind, sun, humidity, and uh, what have you, uh, we know it's a gut issue, but wanted to know if there's specific testing to help oh. target um, what's affecting his face and his uh, skin so bad. Um, they don't want to be on, on the antibiotics forever yep. and don't believe that there's uh, nothing more to be done. You know, it's, it's quite interesting that the doctors that gave the antibiotic can't even understand the course of care that that person needs. Think about it. Okay, now think about this. Um, I know this has never happened uh, to anybody. All of a sudden, they have a very stressful day. Could have been from work, could have been something that way. And all of a sudden, you go home and your spouse says, hi, honey. And because you're so sensitive and you're kind of irritable, you kind of yell at them. <laughs> and they're like, what's wrong? Well, they're just very sensitive. So that's why this person has a lot of internal inflammatory things and all of a sudden, external things like wind and sun and things like that are affecting them. 
It's not the outside things. Do you get it? There's internal things. And by far, people do not realize this. There's no doubt that foods can be a contributing factor to rosacea. But when you're that sensitive, now let me make this very clinically um, clear. I want you to do this. I want everybody to experiment with me. When you're done watching the show, I want you to walk outside, grab a small little pebble, and you have to keep your shoes on all day long, and throw a pebble in your shoe. And I want you to walk around. You can't sit the rest of the day. I want you to walk around. And I call you or your spouse tonight. How irritable are you going to be from that mm -hmm. little pebble? You're going to be sensitive like crazy. But here's what happens. It's because you're getting irritated all the time. Most people eat three to five times a day. No, no one should eat three to five times a day, but most people eat three to five times a day with snacking and so that. So you're not irritated all the time. But if you have consistent irritation, there is some bacteria, parasite, virus, something in there that is causing a constant pebble in your shoe. So now, when the simplest things from the outside, even a food or something like that, and boom, you flare up, guess what happens? There's some consistent pebble in your shoe, and I'll tell you right now, if you ever want to see the most chronic sick people, there's some overgrowth, there's some immune deficiency, there's some immune problem that has led to them even having an overgrowth of yeast that could have been from the normal flora. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, the most common stomach infection there is, is called H. pylori. You'd be like, Doc, we gotta kill off all the H. pylori. You can't kill off all the H. pylori. You know why? You can't digest food if you kill off all the H. pylori. See, a lot of our infections, a lot of our irritants, come from an immune imbalance, and now there's an overgrowth. You know, ladies, I have always said this, most women know somebody or themselves that experience a vaginal yeast infection. And I'll say, where did it come from? And like, oh, I don't know. It actually came from your own normal flora being overgrown because you had some immune problem. And see, that's the thing about it. When that person needs to start with something, they need to start with a very good stool test. So you can go to our website, Genova with Parasitology, and get a stool test done, and you're gonna be able to see the imbalances and things that, and how your immune system is responding, and all the microbes, and there could be a parasite, there actually could be, and, and the nice thing is, you get tested for it, and that's the place to start. So, that'd be my answer. All right, uh, Dr. Patrick, if you've been hard on your liver for years, uh, but you're in need of a heavy metal detox, am I able to start any time, or do I need to do things before working up to be able to detox safely? Um, remember, we use the word detox. I don't, I don't know if I ever told you guys this. I don't even like the term detox. <laughs> it's kind of misconception. You're saying your body is always trying to rid something that doesn't belong there regardless. Now, yes, is there because of the liver um, talk, talking and liver points and even learning stuff, there's you know, phase one detoxification, phase two. So that's why detox is used. But you got to remember, your body is detoxing every cell every day, trying to do the best it can. Um, so what you need to do is this. It depends on how much symptomatology you want to go through. You can hit everything hard, but you may have headaches. You may actually have symptomatology. It may be tough on you. You may have circulation that, uh, that could change. You may break out in your skin. It depends on how intense and how quickly you want to go. Um, most people, I would say, start somewhere small. And if it's males, I know it sounds interesting. I would actually start by supporting the liver. And the reason I say males, because there is a caveat when it comes to this. Um, the most protective thing in herb for the liver is actually milk thistle. But, but, it's a little bit of a stimulant so you can have some symptomatology. And the reason why I say males, I would start there. Women, I would start there, but I'd only start with milk thistle um, if women had their iron levels tested. Because one thing that scares me about it is women can become very deficient in iron if they take milk thistle long term. So they have to always be that kind of balance because if you're anemic, you don't want to do milk this, you want to do something more like dandelion root. So that's why sometimes when a patient came in, I measured the ferritin, the iron saturation, everything like that, and they wanted, and we wanted to even help their liver. I actually had a woman that had cirrhosis because she was an alcoholic. And it's gonna protect it like crazy. Um, milk this is very, the ciliarium is very protective, like protective of the liver. We talked about chemotherapy before. That woman's going through chemotherapy. I can honestly tell you, I will make a blanket statement. Um, even if the woman, woman was anemic, I still gave them milk thistle to protect their liver during chemotherapy, mm. every, both males and females. Every time I found someone was going through chemotherapy, 
I actually gave them milk thistle to protect their liver so it could actually even deal with their chemotherapy better. So it um, depends how quickly people want to start. I would, if you're sick, go in head first because you need change fast. Okay. Yeah, these are a lot of, uh, a lot of great info tidbits. Um, all right, so Dr. Patrick, I would really love your help. I'm having severe fatigue that typically hits around 3 p.m. in the afternoon and daily. It's so severe that I'm sitting up and uh, struggling to um, stay awake and I'm falling asleep. Um, I was told that I have a sluggish thyroid, but I'm not sure. Uh, no one can tell me what's wrong and they're praying for answers. Um, great question, but it's not your thyroid. It's really not. Everybody always equates weight and energy with their thyroid. No, if everything is this way, it's actually more of your mitochondria that produces your ATP where you get your energy, a whole nother story. But the idea is this, is when you look at these things, think about it. Why 3 p.m.? Why? It's like people always say, Doc, I all of a sudden wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning like clockwork and I'm wide awake. And um, gotta remember, we have something called our circadian rhythm. See, this woman actually is dealing with at low adrenal hormones. And there's a circadian rhythm that happens that gets you up in the morning. That's like, for example, when Bill say, Doc, um, all of a sudden I actually just wake up in the middle of the night and I'm wide awake. Your cortisol is jumping up too early, too high. On the flip side, a lot of people, what they do is they eat and then they have uh, at lunchtime, and because their adrenals and their cortisol can't adapt and the blood sugar goes crazy, what happens is they, your adrenal hormones drop, and therefore you have so much fatigue and Gary get through the day. So if that woman just, number one, starts by supporting her adrenals, now what I would do, honestly, I would want to see her lab first. Let me be very clear. I'd like to see a circadian rhythm test done on her. Um, that can be done by saliva or urine. If you do a Dutch test, you get both of them. But I'd actually, if they were significantly low, I'd start with some licorice. Um, but another thing that I'd do is this. You might want to need some ashwagandha um, during lunchtime and help your adrenals adapt to it that way. But then come back to this. There is still something that's stressing out your adrenals. The reason why you do have low hormones is because you've been under, under a lot of stress for a long time. And the stress could be physical, mental, or chemical. So there's more than just mental stress. So therefore, by getting her adrenals some support, that would change very quickly and it'd give you some time to figure out what the stressors are. All right, so I've seen you on TikTok now and you caught my attention by your perspective. Can you explain why you think that perimenopause is more a made up stage rather than an actual stage of life? Yeah, that, that has been so controversial when I started talking about that. Mm -hmm. If you look at the stages of life when it comes to, you know, me and Dr. Colin, and Dr. Patrick and Travis here, you know, we have our young boy years and then we have puberty and then we're just pubescent the rest until we day we die. Okay. Women actually have stages of young lady cyclic menopause. And what happens is the transitional time, they tried to create a term called perimenopause. And it's very hard to define because you can see even on Mayo Clinic's website, they talk about a perimenopause can happen really quickly or it can be drawn out over 12 years. I'm like, no. The reason why it can be drawn out over 12 years is because you were sick as a young girl, you didn't know how to take care of your hormones, and then therefore the transition from going from cyclic to menopausal is such an up and down, and such a deep transition that causes so many symptomatology and problems that they create a term like, well, here's going through perimenopause. No, see, when a woman came to me and said, doc, I'm, I'm, I'm in perimenopause, and then I run a lab and all their hormones are bad, you're not in perimenopause. You've actually been led by a wrong doctor and now your hormones are crap and you're living a horrible life and you have all these symptoms and as we start to change that and get your hormones balanced back out, all the symptoms and stuff dissipate. So what happened? Perimenopause. Mm -hmm. You understand? And I even had a woman either transition perfectly into menopause or they actually went back cycling normally on a regular basis. So I just don't get it. I'm like going, you know, I just don't get it. I just believe it's a, see people do this. Um, this happens all the time. People sometimes define themselves by their sickness. You understand? And they, and they, they, they hold on to it. And you're wrong. Being sick is, is horrible. It absolutely is in, it's devastating. It can, it can make it very difficult to get through the day. But it's not who you are. You understand? And, so, and that's why people are like, oh, I'm in perimenopause. Um, okay, what do you mean? You understand? You know, it's like, oh, you know, something will go through. Do you understand that they'll go through, and this happens very commonly in menopause. They'll have something rough day that way. We say, oh, I'm just in menopause. Well, there's a lot of women in menopause that are not going through a rough day like you. Oh, I never thought about that. See, it's all about perspective. Perspective. Mm -hmm. You understand? So that's why I don't believe that perimenopause should be taken seriously. It should be taken seriously that a woman gets her hormones measured properly. 
and see which stage they're really at. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually help them transition from a good stage from cyclic to menopause. Yeah, and it's, it's frustrating too, because I have a friend that uh, she's like a high intense athlete and you know, uh, she was just diagnosed with perimenopause and um, after learning kind of your perspective on uh, the female hormones and especially being like extremely fit, uh, then you could just kind of see that from the outside of just like, yeah, you're draining your hormones and doing a lot of damage to your body, even though you're so healthy muscular yep. wise. And um, so moving on to the male perspective, uh, can taking nettle leaf help testosterone levels go up? Yeah, it can, but that's, I want to give you a different perspective on that. See, nettle can actually be a very good aromatase inhibitor. So therefore it doesn't allow a bunch of your testosterone to convert into estrogens. So therefore it keeps them up on a regular basis. And I love nettle. Last night I took nettle. And talk about all the conglomeration that way, I took nettle, I really did. Now why did I take nettle? Because I had cheesecake and I didn't want my testosterone converted into estrogens. I didn't want to wake up all emotional and stuff like that. So whole nother story. But anyways, um, so I took nettle and I took albizia and I took all the things of like that because I did have some sugar yesterday. But that being said, um, nettle is very common in formulas for testosterone because what it also does this is very, this is, a, this is a trick. This is a trick that all these supplement companies and all these commercials, watch this, watch this. See, to, Nettle does a wonderful job of help unbinding testosterone from its protein to make it more free and available. That's why in a lab you'll see testosterone and free testosterone. And Nettle's a very good formula with, with the compounds and constituents in it that help you release more free testosterone. So that's why if you watch the commercials and watch the fine print, they, they talk about testosterone and they're legally allowed to say testosterone when they even mean free testosterone, but in the fine print, it'll say, help your free testosterone go up. Ooh, nice deceptive marketing tool. You know what I'm saying? And they're wrong. This, I can honestly tell you, women need a lot of nettle when you see a lab where the testosterone is normal, but their free testosterone is low. That's very common in women, very common in women. So you, I put thousands of women on nettle based on their lab work that way. But it's a little trick when they talk about nettle and testosterone. Now, don't worry, nettle does ha have some aromatase inhibiting activity, so therefore it can maintain some of the testosterone levels that you have instead of losing them, but it doesn't help you produce testosterone. That's the little, that's the little secret, the false secret that you see all GNC and all these people do in their advertising. But see, in the fine print, and the stuff that they post you can barely see on the TV screen, or the fine print, dig a little deeper. See, that's why people say, uh, Doc, uh, that was good for testosterone. Okay, tell me how. What's the compounds, what's the physiology, what's the biochemistry behind it? I can tell you to a detail what it does. That's how detailed our practitioners, our interns, and everything are trained on. Good question. Yeah, um, Yeah. so based on that, uh, have you ever had a male um, have normal testosterone but still have ED? Absolutely, absolutely. You can still have uh, erectile dysfunction. Now, I would say it'd be more like a 75, well, I'll put this, the older they get, yes. Younger, no, not really, unless they have some major uh, vascular issues. Because remember, if you look at most of the erectile dysfunction pills, they're not affecting testosterone, they're affecting blood flow. Mm -hmm. So as they get older, there are some cardiovascular, there are some problems, and they can have normal testosterone and not it. Now, if you're young, and have, if, you're, if you're below 60, maybe 50, I'd say it would be more safe to say, and you have erectile dysfunction problems, your testosterone's a mess. Uh, over those ages, you could have a little bit of both just because of vascular issues that can do it, and then uh, you can't get blood flow there. Um, and uh, um, yeah, that would say probably the biggest two factors. Uh, on that, do you think that nitric oxide would help that? Of course it does. That's why Neo40 is, and Nathan Bryant, the expert is, is uh, I can actually tell you, even if a young man would have it, I would still put him on it just to create the vasodilation. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Good to know. Um, not, not for me personally. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so why are you so obsessed with female hormones? I've watched so many of your videos and have learned a lot, but it just seems creepy that a man talks so much about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love, hey, it's a question. I like it. All right. Okay. Um, let, let me say this, and let me put it from this standpoint, is I don't care if you're male or female. If you see a problem in the world and you can fix it, 
I don't care if you're, if, if a woman actually could become the best at figuring out male, test, male hormone problems, let her do it. Heck, what do you think our, what do you think our amazing docs do? Uh, just so you guys let you know, uh, Dr. Lena, she is a female, you know what I'm saying? And she identifies as one, okay? And this, <laughs> uh, we won't go there. But the idea is this, <laughs> but the idea is this. And I guarantee Dr. Lena and stuff is going to, as you saw, she was up here, she's gonna have guys come in with erectile dysfunction. And she's gonna be able to be like, look over the labs as a, as a male guy and be like, hey, I need you this, this, and they have success. And the excitement as a doctor that she will have to make that change will be unmatchable. And therefore, she may enjoy it, she may be able to talk about it, she may, and, and that's what happened, that happened in my world. And, and then I then have four daughters. And you look at it, and what I did is I recognized the problem when I was 24 years old. And I'm going, females are sick. And on top of it, think of it this way. To be able to, as a young man, and um, wait, who's, who's the youngest here? Which one, how old, who's the youngest? Caroline. Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> so, so imagine this. Dr. Caroline, she's 25. Okay, think about this, she's 25. There might be something that passionately catches her eye in clinical care that she becomes obsessed with. And then she becomes a great problem solver of that issue. Well, when I was 24, and I'm looking going, there's a bunch of estrogens and nobody's talking about it. Now, if that was a male hormone, then I'd have been talking about males like crazy. But the dominant hormone is actually in females. And I realized after talking to females, and I just said this, uh, hey, Dr. Jenny, um, you know, you're 27 years old, 27 now, yep, and um, he has a question, have you had all your estrogens tested? And like, um, she says yes now, but when I first met her, she didn't. And I met her when she was 24. Well, the idea is this, think of it this way. Well, then how did a 24-year-old get to her age and never have the most dominant hormones that make her who she has tested yet? And Dr. Carolyn, you're 25 years old. I met you some years ago, okay, two years ago. And guess what happens? Um, before you met me, did you have all your estrogens tested? And she's like this, she said no. And, so that, and that's all I did. And I was their age going, um, and I talked to my mom, and I talked to this next female. And then as we started to have that come about and see in their lives dramatically get better, just couldn't stop talking about it. Couldn't stop sharing it with other women because I knew I could make their life better. So if that's creepy, I guess I'm a creep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If I want to make women's lives better by giving them an idea about something that way, sorry, I guess I'm going to be a creeper the rest of my life then because <laughs> I just am saddened that women are not getting the information that they need and I, have, I can speak it. And you get this. I spoke at a seminar where there were seven female speakers and me. And when they filled out seven female doctors, and they weren't chiropractors, they were medical people, and they were me. And out of the eight doctors on all the forums, actually I dominated as far as being the number one like speaker, made the most sense, gave them clinical application, and there was all female doctors. And I wasn't trying to compete with them, I was sharing an idea that could make all the other people in that audience their life better. So, I guess I'll be obsessed the rest of my life about it that way because I believe that with the dominant perspective and thinking medically, they're gonna lead women down the wrong path and we won't. So, yep. I mean, I can't imagine it's creepy to want better health for people, yep. you know? That's okay, I still, I still respect everybody's opinion. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've been called a lot worse than, than <laughs> creepy. My goodness. <laughs> Um, so I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one personally, but uh, if you could run only one test for a woman, what would it be? Oh man, that's, someone's, they're pigeonholing me. <laughs> I can honestly tell you, it's gonna surprise people because people think I'm gonna say the Dutch test. That's not really true. The number one test I ran clinically my whole practice that was dominated, now I didn't run out in every person, but if you look at domination of the tests I ran, it's actually the blood work of with, I call it the thyroid hormones. Now what is it? I just sat down and wrote out labs where I believe gave me a good perspective of multiple organ systems and stuff like that, that related to the immune system, related to multiple organs, related to the thyroid, related to the anabolic hormones, related to adrenals. And actually it's blood work that I just had done. So it's called the thyroid hormones. It's, not a, it's just something I put together, a group of labs that gave me such a perspective that I could start on. So I would obviously say a thyroid hormones would be, still this day, mm -hmm. would be that. Now, yes, if somebody comes in directly for breast cancer, I would say I want a Dutch test or specific conditions, but if I was gonna run one lab, especially if it's female, it would be that. 
All right. <clears throat> All right, so I'm 55 years old, and I watched your reel on licorice and hot flashes, and some of it got me to say wow and kind of um, take a d uh, different perspective and uh, dramatic difference in their life. Um, they still have some issues. What more do they need to do? Okay, so the person watched the reel, got licorice, got some results, but still has some issues. Yes. Well, that's what I've been trying to tell everybody. No, no joke. They need to get tested because if you're having hot flashes, my first get going, you need some adrenal support. Now, how much adrenal support? I don't know. You know saying? So if you do take some licorice, you might take not enough, but you also may need some other things. Mm -hmm. See, so that's why it's always hard for me when people ask during reels, like what supplement things I could take, which I can give you a good idea and I can give you something that's going to give your body the ability to actually work better and actually create some sufficiency from those deficiencies. There's going to be a lot of people that watch this and actually have high blood pressure, take some potassium and see a positive change. But you can't just do that. You can't just take licorice. You need some guidance. That's why, once again, go to our website, find a clinic um, at the thewellnessway.com, find a clinic. You need to be guided. See, I've always taught every practitioner that I have, doesn't matter what your background is, from a nurse to a chiropractor to anything, to a chiropractor, anything. We are tour guides. We're tour guides. We know how to lead you. And you want to jump on the bus and take a ride with a tour, we're going to give you the greatest ride to health you ever have. And you can get off anytime you want. You know what I'm saying? But the idea is this is you need to guide it that way. That person that actually, I'm so happy they've seen a reduction in their hot flashes. That's kind of common, you say, I'm, but that's not gonna resolve everything. You need more than licorice and you need some other things. That you gotta dig on those stressors. You gotta see if there's other hormones that are off. That's why being guided and also getting some proper labs. Something that's universal between all of our practitioners is testing people. You heard with Dr. Jason in, that, in, this, in the testimonial. They, you, you had to dig deep. It doesn't mean I can't say take this and see some positive change. That's just clinical experience. But to really figure somebody out, you need to get a detailed testing. Mm -hmm. That's our next step. And that's what I love about kind of like the initial uh, <coughs> scope that we had of just like we don't guess, we test. We yep. need to know. Yep. So based on that, uh, what's your perspective on taking trace minerals in a multivitamin? Uh, obviously, we need trace minerals. Best sources of food, best sources of liver. I don't agree in multivitamins. I, ca I call our liver capsule the multivitamin of the wellness white. Um, because if you try look at a store bought in vi uh, multivitamin, it never hits the RDAs needed. And on top of it, a lot of it's synthetic. And if you find a good organic one, they're still very deficient in the amount of RDAs you need. Um, that's why I say, listen, get your trace minerals. And I don't have a problem if you supplement with them. I'd actually more be taking liver capsules for our trace minerals and other factors. Um, and that's why I said diet's by far the thing, but if you're gonna do a multivitamin, do encapsulated liver. And if you really wanna get more minerals and more nutrients, do an encapsulated uh, form of all organ meats, including pancreas and other things that way. And that's why I love our, our glands source. Awesome. All right, so you're gonna get called out on this one. Uh-oh, <laughs> son of a gun. I was already called a creep. Yep. <laughs> so we're starting out hot. Uh, starting out hot. Uh, I know you don't take any new patients, but still uh, take care of some people. Will you ever go back into full-time practice? Will I ever go back in full-time practice? Remember, I'll never say never. Do I see myself doing it anytime in the near future? Absolutely not. Um, as even in, in our Jason's testimony video, every month, including you guys, Dr. Colin Lena, guess what happens? We have more offices opening up every single month. Um, the, I spend a lot of time training everybody on everything. And so therefore, as I train these guys, they can go and branch out and take care of a ton of people. When I'm sitting one-on-one -on -one with a patient, there's only so much time in a day. There's only so much things you can do in a day. So right now, do I see it? Um, people say, well, doc, you saw a female patient on Monday. Yep, I did. I still am obsessed with it. I still have the obsession of making that clinical change. It's just something that's a part of me. And I'm trying to transfer that to all of our docs. If you've been in practice for 20 years, you've been in practice starting here, coming up in Florida. Um, so, but you know something is this? Let's say life changed. Could I go into a small office, um, grab my computer for my notes, get my labs, sit down, and take care of patients every single day, yeah. I'd have no problem doing it like crazy, and it'd be extremely enjoyable, and um, I'd have no problem. I, really, I would have no problem if that's where life brought me. So, yep. 
And this person wants to know who's smarter, you were a medical doctor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Let's put it into context a little bit. If it's brain surgery, the neurosurgeon is a genius and I know nothing. When it comes to health, restoring bodies, we're the geniuses and they know nothing. Do you see Sam? It's like, you know, get this. I just am by far not a handy person. People say, you know, that means if, um, if um, something happens in, uh, in the um, garbage disposal and I guarantee, no joke, a couple of our docs will get up there, rip it apart, put it back together. I'm like, um, garbage disposal fixer, can you come and do this for me? You know what I'm saying? It's just, I know what I'm good at, you know what I'm saying? It's like, um, and therefore, and I mean this sincerely, let's go back to what I was just talking about. I spoke at a medical seminar with medical people sitting in the thing, from nurses, everything that way, MDs, everything. And when it came to the perspective on hormones, how to take care and what to do with them, I mean, just very humbly, but I'm sorry. I know people freak out when you say you're great at something. I was the smartest one in the room. Do you see him? Now, if there, was a, if there was a podiatrist there on foot surgery, he may have been the smartest person in foot surgery in the room. I would have been, I would have been a, just a fan of listening to his expertise. See, that's the thing. It's like, we're not trying to say we're smarter or better, but darn it. Remember, a documentary we're going to put out there, What Has Helped? You asked the average clinician, doctor, what it is and how to achieve it, they're clueless. You know what I'm saying? But I'm clueless on other medical procedures, because I won't say healthcare, other medical procedures that I didn't go to school for, nor do I want to, nor am I going to give you any advice on it. I just get really frustrated when medical doctors don't keep their mouth shut when they should. Because when I started practice, there was Jesus and there was a medical doctor right there. And until the internet separated and knock them down, especially over the last two years of COVID. They lie a lot. I'm sorry, they lie a lot. And then here's the catchphrase I always say, science says, yeah. Uh, science said that, uh, doctors said that in their advertising that camels were the best cigarettes to smoke too at one time. <laughs> so, yep. <laughs> Can you share what it took to create the company that you did? Um, can I share what it took? To be? First of all, let's start out when I started out. There had to be a relentless pursuit in the face of opposition, even from people that loved you. It's going to be something funny, and let's use Colin Lena, for example. Um, now, the nice thing is I met their parents. They came to a hormone Protection seminar. I kind of won them over a little bit because of the idea that way. And they were even excited. I remember talking to Colin's mom and dad, and he wasn't even there, and just had just an amazing people, wonderful conversation with them. And I saw the excitement in their eyes to see what Colin and Leah could do for people in the future. You know, when I started practice, I used to have, go to family reunion, and people would make fun of me. You know, you think you do this, this, I'm like, cool. And I had to, in the, in the, in the, in the face of adversity and criticism, even from people that loved you, you know, Sam, you had to, um, I don't want to say this on camera because there might be some kids listening, but you had to not give a, <laughs> it starts with an F, okay? You just had to not. I still, have that, I still have that today. And even if there's someone internally within your life or externally um, in your life, you know, I mean, like, let's say somebody makes a comment or does it in that way. You just had to pursue forward. Then there was a stage of life where I was like, or a season in life where I realized, and let's use Dr. Jason, for example, and come to the past question. When I started, I built the company while I was actually still seeing patients full time, and then I'd work another hours like crazy to actually do more things and realize that, listen, there's only so much time in a day. That's why I came up with priorities. There is only so much one individual could do. So I realized you need our people. And then that concept, when my concept realizes that in order to accomplish anything great, you need other great people. And you, I said, great people. Most people, and this is gonna sound weird, are not great. Especially of today, you know what I'm saying? Um, just because, you know, 
their mamas, every mama tells their kid they're special and everybody gets to participate in procreation So when they get out to the real world and have to push, they don't. They think by just showing up, things are gonna be good. So that's why I'm big on growth and development on people to the point where that can lead people to not like you. I always tell people, you know, um, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm, if I was the flavor of ice cream, I'm not chocolate. You know why? Everybody loves chocolate. I'm kind of like ca caramel cashew. You either love me or you hate me. There is no in between. I've always told people that. You'll love me or hate me and stuff. And that, cause you know why? Cause in order to actually build something great, you need other people, but you need those people to be great too. They need to have a drive and obsession and things like that, especially in the profession that I'm in, that we're in. Do you understand that we are still looked at a subset of the real doctors? Yet the real doctors, once again, last week I think I had multiple medical associations call for me to come speak. Do you understand? And so it has, number one, you better be able to, to look at adversity and keep moving forward. Number two, you better be able to develop people and that's why when people say, well, Doc, get in full-time practice, I can't. I spend more time in investing into other people. And you have to invest in other people knowing that they could turn on you, knowing that they could never be with you. So I actually come up with another answer. You better be, as an individual, emotionally and mentally strong, otherwise you'll give up. I've seen this in a lot of professions, but I also see it in our kind of profession. That's why I know it's really funny. And this is, where, this, is where, um, this is where sometimes people won't like what I say. A student, doesn't matter if you're in what profession you're in. And we've seen this over the last two years, watch this. And I'm saying of all students, medical, chiropractic, naturopathic, um, surgeons, everything that way. Every student, because they live under the foundation and security blanket of school, will always think they're gonna change the world. They do. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this, this, this. And if they're not strong when they walk out to the world, the world changes them. I'm going to give you a perspective. Watch this. You know something? If someone told me to do this and I'm strong enough, I'm working on myself, and I go to church every Sunday and I believe in God and that's the living God and that's who I believe in that way and, and that's the only thing that I'm strong in my faith, COVID comes along. And all the people that showed up at churches that should have been strong, said they're strong, got out to the world, got out of their little bubble of showing up on Sunday or a Bible study every Sunday or Wednesday, and went out to the world and the world changed them. That's why not everybody's ready to be a wellness way doc, a wellness way practitioner. And I have no problem looking at somebody and say, nah, you're not ready. I hate you, you arrogant person. I need world changers, not people that conform to the world. So not really fit for it. I know it's tough. That's why people say, Doc, I want to do what you do. I'm like, be careful what you ask for. Because <laughs> you're going to get people that just hate you. There's people that despise my name, and they trained under me. That's why I tell people, I tell students, you have to learn not to give a what people think. It's a quality that is needed to develop anything in life and do anything great. So, yeah, that was quite a question. <laughs> and that kind of speaks on this next one. Uh, Dr. Patrick, I'm your biggest fan and watch all your videos, reels, and shows. I even find myself reading the comments and have a question. Most of your comments are great and some of them are mean and disrespectful and I get upset and saddened uh, just reading them because I know how nasty some people can be. If it was me, I don't know if I could handle it. Uh, so how do you move forward every day knowing that people are attacking you and critical about everything out there? Just not give up. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, what it comes down to, it, there's the, I do have a little bit of different answer on that one. Okay. Um, this is going to surprise people, and, I, and, I, and you guys have heard me say this, but it's really serious. Um, people sometimes define themselves by what they do instead of who they are. See, now let me, let me just give a general example for you if you've never heard me say this. If I walk up to an amazing woman and she has three kids, husband, nice job, everything like that, and I'll say, tell me who you are. Do you understand by a shadow of doubt? 
And I actually had, I actually had my interns do this. It's a part of their training. I'll say, go up to your mother and say, who are you? Do you know by far the number one thing a woman say, well, I'm mother. No, 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 it's not true. That's what you do. Because there's, that's what you do. That's not who you are. No, 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 my kids, they're part, uh-uh. It's still what you do because before you had kids, you were something different. So you cannot define yourself by what you do. Because watch this. Come on, mothers, watch this. There's mothers that, um, this happens a lot in our practices, that a mom will stop giving her kids frosted flakes. And there'll be other moms that still give them frosted flakes. And the mom says, yeah, I just don't give my kids that anymore. The other mom, without even saying that they still do it that way, will say, well, I'm a bad mom because, because I give my kids frosted flakes. See, everybody defines themselves by what they do instead of who they are. I don't define myself by what I do. So you can tear on what I do. You can even tear on who I am, but then it's kind of funny. I'm like, then you don't know who I am. See, I know it sounds funny. I know who I am. I do. You think I'm joking. And watch this. I have four girls. If you know my four daughters, <laughs> they're dramatically different. Yeah, there's some similarities and things like that, but they're dramatically different. And here's what happens. And this is how, this is how I can create daddy issues um, when it comes to my children. If I were to look at Faith and Trinity, and I looked at Trinity and said, you need to be more like Faith. Because she does this. Trinity's going to be like, internally she's going to realize that I don't know her. And when somebody doesn't know you, you disconnect from them. On the flip side, if I looked at Faith and said, you need to be more like Trinity. Guess what happens? Unknowingly, they'll still inside go, my daddy doesn't know me. Do you say I am? So I'm always teaching my girls, from my 8-year-old to my 19-year-olds, know who you are. And here's what happens this. This is my thing. I may be your dad, but God created you. And you have the characteristics that he instilled in you. And one of my daughters is very outgoing. One of my daughters is a little bit more subdued and quiet. If I look at the quiet one and say, be more outgoing. Or I look at another one and say, quiet down. You're going to destroy them. And see, as a parent, it's our job to mature them, which isn't meaning make them me or make them their mother or their father. It's to understand their characteristics. So the one that's really loud, okay, go, okay, listen, it's a funeral. You need to shut up a little bit. Because maturity is just understanding your characteristics at the appropriate time. You say, I'm, um, uh, like I tell people, I'm coarse. You know, that means be downright rude. Well, you shouldn't be rude. That means you don't know me. You say, I'm. and being mature, there's sometimes you're coarse, sometimes you're not. It's based on the circumstance that way. That's maturity. You ever notice this? Look at, look at a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old. They haven't matured yet, but you can see all their characteristics. They're right there. And then they go to five, they go to school, and they suppress them, and everybody has to be this little robot, everybody the same. And the best kids are the ones that subdue to the teacher's characteristics that they like. Do you say, I'm? I'm sitting there going, that's what I really told my teachers. I always told my, told my daughters. I'll say, respect your teachers, but don't listen to them. Even at the Christian schools. I'm like, I don't care what your Christian teacher says. I actually told, I think I'm joking. Um, this happened one time. A teacher wanted to discipline my child. And some of that, I'm like, no, you don't discipline my child. You're a teacher. And I drunk. And I taught my daughter to respect her teacher. And guess what happened? And I'm like, but teach like, well, you know, discipline. I'm like, no, 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 no. You're not disciplinarian. You're meant to do this. I will discipline my child, and she will be respectful in your classroom and things like that. And <clears throat> because here's what happens is she's meant to listen to her parent, not a teacher. And see, it's kind of funny. I have a different perspective on it. And wrong. I handled it. I handled it. It's not my, it's not my teacher's job to grow up a kid. It's my job. And the teacher later thanked me for the perspective I had because if more parents had your perspective, it'd be easier as me as a teacher. I said, I know. I said, I know. But at first, they fought me. So I totally forgot our question. What's our question again? <laughs> no, I think you answered it. It okay, was really good. just kind of a, um, Got me yeah, a little more rant. of a personal and yeah, being uh, personally attacked and being oh, critical yeah. so, and stuff. So here's so. what happens this. But see, here's what happens this. That I was willing as a father of that child to not give a crap if that teacher liked my perspective or not. 
See, it's really funny. Do you understand that if you go through life trying to please everybody, you'll please nobody, and you're the one to be stressed out about it? You understand? And that's the part I just am trying to instill in people because I've said this before, and I mean this. Anybody that controls you, you'll eventually resent. You will. Doesn't matter if it's your spouse, parent, they everything. Friend, loved one, if they have any form of control over you for a long period of time, you'll resent them. You will. And if you ever think of it this way, everybody's taught to conform to somebody else's control. And if people say, well, people are out of control? No. See, it's always the extreme people that say, out of control? No, no. You know what I'm saying? Most people, actually, most people just want to be left alone. They really do. They want to enjoy life and be left alone. That's most people. There's the people that want to control people. We saw that over the last two years. And there's people like me that will go, I recognize that control and I'm, I'll stand in a gap for people that haven't developed themselves enough. See, I know it sounds funny. When COVID hit, all the people that have been sitting in churches on Sunday and Wednesday, <clears throat> preparing themselves for the world, you, you saw who was prepared. You saw the pastors that were prepared. You saw the congregation that was prepared. And 99% of people weren't. You understand? And so my interns, when they go out to the world, they're prepared. They're prepared. They're prepared to be attacked. They're prepared for it. That's what people say, well, Doc, it must be so nice uh, being at work with you. No, it's not. Because sometimes I will prepare them to the point that they cry. Because actually, at least they know that I care for them and I want the best for them. And the world doesn't. I do. Any other questions? Uh, there's a few more on health. Uh, if you want to go back onto the health uh, topic. Yep. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we have one from Dorothy. Uh, she's asking, what can I do to improve eye health? She's had LASIK before, but 25 years later, her eyes have reverted back to yep. what they were before. Yep, now if you look at this way, when you look at the optic nerve, it's a nerve that's sensitive light. So therefore, number one, toxicity is one of the biggest things that, that do it. Especially if you start to have a problem seeing contrast at night. So people say, not night blindness, but it's harder to see night, harder to see signs that way. There's usually some toxic effect. Heavy metals have a very toxic effect on the optic nerve. Number two, vitamin A, vitamin D deficiencies. So many people lack vitamin A, it's scary. And think this way, carrots have vitamin A, it's good for the eyes. Rabbits have good eyes. You ever hear that when you're a kid? That's what we always told. They are saying carrots don't have vitamin A. You're saying carrots do not have vitamin A. They have a pro-vitamin called beta carotene, which has to be converted, and most of them can't convert it to a fat-soluble vitamin A. So therefore, that's why if you look at people that are actually dealing with vitamin A deficiencies, they also have eye problems. Plus, plus, one of the number one reasons why eyes are being destroyed is because of blood sugar levels. We come back to it again. That's why you see diabetics have a very significant high rate of eye problems. That's why if you ever think of this way, neuropathy, distant nerves, the optic nerve is a distant nerve that's sensitive to light, blood sugar issues, vitamin A deficiency, toxicities. Those are the big things with eye health. So that's why you see things like cod liver oil, macuna seed, vitamin A stuff like liver and all your organ meats and stuff like that. Really good for eye health. Okay. Best thing to take for sleep. Um, okay, you shouldn't have to take anything for sleep, but I'm a big fan of melatonin and stuff just because, I, and I would rather see a person get their melatonin by getting into the sun, by getting into infrared sauna, um, but also I have no problem if I do it myself because I travel a lot and my circadian rhythm, especially if you go overseas, uh, you may need to take some melatonin before that. And then therefore I also like valerian that can actually make your GABA more sensitive so when you do produce your sleep hormone, that calms the nervous system down that way. But I would tell you right now, and also remember, high levels of stress, high levels of cortisol, high levels of sugar will affect your sleep. But if you look at some things I would do for sleep, just even to get your circadian rhythm back to normal, I start with some melatonin at night. And you can start very small, start with one, like three milligram pill that way. And some people need to build up to 12. You see? And when you have a lot of chronic inflammation, your mitochondria need a ton of melatonin. And therefore, that's why a lot of times people won't sleep because their melatonin is consuming up all their, excuse me, mitochondria consume up all their melatonin and then they don't have it for sleep. 
And these last two are going to kind of summar uh, summarize like everything that we've talked about so Kay. far. Um, so I need more energy throughout the day. Uh, yep. What can I take um, to have more energy in the day? Oh, kind of said that right there. Um, no joke. It's going to be hot today. I'm going to get some sun. Yeah. You saying? Because you're going to, your mitochondria needs fuel. That's where the majority of our ATP and stuff comes from and what we need for it that way. Um, that's why you see things like people take like Coenzyme Q10 for it, things like that. Um, they'll, they'll take like licorice that gives you more energy that way. Um, but I would tell you by beyond shallow doubt, I used to actually do this. Even if they didn't have a problem sleeping, sometimes I'd give people melatonin at night because then their mitochondria did better, produced more ATP, and they woke up and they had a better day through that that way. Um, so support the adrenals. Make sure you get plenty of sleep. Let's start there. All right. And last question, we're talking about the liver again. Okay. I think you're probably going to say milk thistle for this one. Uh, but what herb would you suggest to protect my liver? I'm giving up alcohol, but it's a slow process, and I have cirrhosis. Li yeah, milk thistle. Milk thistle. Now, if it's a female, make sure that you do not have any anemia. Got to be a little careful that way. But idea is this. Milk thistle, by far, is the most protective herb when it comes to it. You got to remember, but it also has a little stimulating effect on some of the pathways, so you got to make sure it metabolizes. That's why guys suffer usually from high iron. That's why milk thistle does really well because it helps you metabolize your iron and pushes out. And that's why milk thistle taken for a long period of time can cause anemia in a woman because men don't suffer from anemia a lot unless they have some major bleeding problem, ulcer, ulcerative colitis, things like that. Then they can have more of an anemia problem. But women suffer from anemia cyclically a lot due because obviously they lose blood every single month. So, yes. Yeah, that's it. That's all we have. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Patrick, for that. And thank you for those questions. Wow. Some questions that were in great detail clinically. Some questions that were personal, some questions that I had to be a little sassy with that way and everything. So, you know, um, yeah, those are fantastic questions. I really do. Um, next week, I know what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to actually do a series on menopause and have a supplement that we're going to do in there. But what I want to do now is this, is I'd like to move into now my last 10. Oh, wait, no, take it back. I take it back. I forgot it. I almost, tra Travis caught me on that one. Thank you, Travis. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to move into our hot topic. And hot topics are things that are, that are evident that come up on a regular basis uh, from things that affect our health care. So we did our mother's moment for our hot topics. We're going to do, do our hot topic and move into our mother's moment. All right, so Travis is going to play our Mother's Moment segment, one of our favorite segments with Jamie, so here we are. And welcome to our Hot Topic, and I want to put our Mother's Moment in our Hot Topic because there are some things going on across our country that I wanted the one, the only, the fabulous, the amazing, the person I get to ruffle some feathers with every day across the world. Uh, Jamie Barkey, thanks for being here today again. Thank you for having me. It's awesome. I always love our mother's moments, one of my favorite segments. Um, and sometimes they're highly emotional. Sometimes um, we get a good laugh out of them. Um, this is a little bit of both because it's emotional, but also um, it's sometimes laughable um, in a disgusting way. We oh, look yeah. at some of the things that way that we just look at each other. There's times Jamie will bring me information and, I, and I'll look and I'll just, I'll shake my head and I'm like, you know, and yes, we will always um, guide people in the right way, but it's almost laughable. So after going through what we got today, what you got to share with everybody today? So every year, the National Education Association meets in usually Chicago, a bigger area. This is the first time they met in Chicago, the beginning of July since 2019 because of COVID restrictions. And I wanted to just share some of the business items inside this National Education Association regional meeting that they had. What they do inside of these meetings, which is, I think, I believe, four days long, is they educate on a multitude of different things, and you can bring new business items. Now, at these meetings, it's 6,000 educators meet to debate the vital issues that impact American public education and set national education association policies. These delegates represent 3 million members of the NEA. It's the biggest teachers union there is. So I just wanted to show just a few of the business items so you guys can be aware of what they're trying to show out there. Now in new business item uh, 37, it talks about mandating 
uh, masking across the board and mandating the COVID vaccines in order for your kids to go to school. Now, this is just one of the items. I believe there was 150 different new business items on the agenda. I will state that this item did get voted down. So I, I do want to make that clear so no one comes back at us. Yep. What I'm trying to bring to your attention mm -hmm. is that they're trying to get this going before school even starts. Now, with all the things going on with the new strain yep. and the monkeypox, they're, they're constantly going to be pushing out this fear. It's just stay aware. Yep. No, go to your school board meetings, hear what the teachers are trying because teachers might give a little pushback. We don't want to go to school, things like that. I did want to bring up another slide just to show a few other business items that this um, National Education Association regional meeting did br bring up. And on this slide, you'll see a multitude of different things. Now, it's only um, three different ones, but if, if there's people out there denying that there is a progressive uh, political agenda making their way into our school our schools, system, yeah. It's it's funny and it's laughable at this point because they're talking about foreign policy, uh, gun rights, and they're talking about sexualizing our kids inside of these new business items. Mm -hmm. Now, as you're well aware, the the National Education Association is a political action committee. Yes, a, um, yep. It's very, very big. They get $6 million. At, in two, uh, 2020, they got $6 million from their funds. So they're very big. They're very active. They mm -hmm. spend $2 million a year in lobbying alone. Um, so I just wanted to bring it to your attention that these things are on the board inside of the biggest teachers union there is. Yep. The last one of the last slides about this is my thoughts. Exactly. This was a Twitter post that Joel Pettin put out there. Inside this slide, it states, the agenda of every education association conference should be focused on education. Leave the rest for the Democratic and Republican National Convention. Inside what he was stating is currently 45 million Americans are functionally illiterate and cannot read above fifth grade level. And it goes along other statistics as well. What we're trying, my thoughts exactly, is why can't the teachers union focus on education? Educating our kids. Yes, because if you're going out there and our our educational system is you're pumping out kids who are illiterate, yep. that's a little alarming. Put the back slide back there. Look at that one statistic there. 25% of students in California school systems are not are, are able to perform basic reading skills. Do you want to know a little fun but, fact about California? So because of their inclusion and all of the stuff that's going on, mm -hmm. they pass kids in math class without them even knowing math. All they got to do is show up. Wow. If they fail at tests, they can retake them with the books open to get the answers or ask for questions because of inclusion. Yep. So they are completely failing the kids that are going to be going out in society. Right. So I did want to bring that to your attention. The last thing they wanted to bring up is primaries are happening in the side of the state of Wisconsin. On Tuesday, we have our Wisconsin primaries. You can yes. go out to this website, see who's on your ballot, where you, are, where you can vote and whatnot. But I wanted to bring this up in a mother's mm -hmm. moment because it's important to bring your kids. Yes, to see the process. Yes, mm -hmm. to get them excited about yep. what happens when I turn the age of 18. How do I vote? How easy yep. is it? You know, also what I've been doing with my girls, my girls are 13 and 10, is I will print out who's on my ballot and then we will go and research yep. what their beliefs are, how they've been voting. I want to educate my kids to take that critical thinking, that action to go and actually research these yep. candidates and what they stand for, not just this is the way mom and dad think. This is the facts yep. on what's happening out there. So I just wanted to bring that up because it's happening Tuesday. Yeah, and the nice thing is that we do the same thing with our older, well, Faith is the only one that can vote, but we also show Trinity. We also show them how important, uh, just the process of actually keeping your liberties is so important to everybody. And you need to be involved. And um, it's exciting to watch uh, what's gonna happen next week. And I believe that, that people we've seen over the last couple of years with everything going on, that they're gonna be out there voting probably more than last you know some years so mm -hmm. excited for this and the one thing is this, if you look at the things that are happening talking about vaccines and talking about uh mass and kids still now and it pops up on there um and the element of what it comes down to is just really simple control mm -hmm. control and remember parents you're in control uh by you showing up by you doing what's right by you 
um, being peaceful in your protest by you being peaceful and but all, but also speaking up. Remember, one of the biggest things that you can do to change is just show up. And the most important thing is showing up for that vote. So next Tuesday in Wisconsin, I'm very excited. You guys have seen the candidates that we've had on here. I'm excited for the primaries to get done on Tuesday and then start the stuff. And it's it's kind of laughable when I was when I was looking at the slides. I'm like going, really? This is what they're covering in there. But the one thing I always find so funny is these action committees um, get government funding. Mm-hmm. Isn't it crazy? I have an action committee, and no joke, and I donate to candidates and stuff like that. That comes from my money. Mm-hmm. It's from my money that I work hard for every day, and then I support candidates I believe in um, civil liberties and civil rights, and believe in freedom. And, um, but I find it so funny that there's action committees that get uh, money from the government to go against the political party. Uh, that's kind of funny. It's yeah. like, I always said this, do you know that Planned Parenthood donates to the Democratic Convention, yet Planned Parenthood gets $500 million a year from our tax dollars? Yep. That shouldn't be allowed. You know what I'm saying? That's like the Fox Garden Hen House that's like, I'm going to keep your people in power, so you just keep on giving us more money and stuff. And I'm like, going, well, that was definitely um, my political action committee. My pact actually is, is, hey, guess what? I have some extra money. I'm going to throw in there. So now I can actually go and um, um, support the candidates that are going to say, guess what? If you want to wear a mask or want to get a vaccine, you can do it. That's up to you. It's your choice. But if you don't want to do it, we'll stand for your freedom and make no government or school or anybody be able to get that. So I'm, I believe that we're going to get the right people through in Wisconsin, which is great. So it's important to fight for each one of your states. So mm-hmm. yeah, thank you so much, Jamie, for all this. And um, like I said, be active in your states, guys. Because remember, all this ties together. We look at vaccines and health and everything that masks and everything you're trying to do with schools. And it starts at your local level. So Jamie, thank you for all the great information. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. But the main point of seeing that is, guys, guess what? Get out to vote. It really is. Because you're voting for your health care when you go out and do that. And no joke, and I'll be very clear, we need to kick out a lot of Democrats. We do. Um, in Wisconsin and everything that way because they're trying to control, they're trying to add masks, trying to have bad vaccines. It's the party of masks and vaccines right now. And so I know I'm being very blunt about that, but elections are next Tuesday. You need to remove those people that actually do not want you to have a choice when it comes to your health care. Because I've always said this, and even when I speak at a political event, it doesn't matter what your viewpoint is, but because I can get you to all to think this way, is who should make the health care decisions for you or your family, the government or you? I've never, never, ever actually had one person say the government. But how you vote is actually how you get to decide and who gets to decide what you could do to mask and vaccines for your kids that way. So, and I will always vote and I always stand in the gap and fight for people's rights for civil rights and civil liberties. So, with that being said, let's move into our last 10%. Now, this past week of questions, which I did not add into there because I think it can wrap up some things to understand uh, not only um, the body, but also some of the perspectives on healthcare, but also per- perspectives on life itself. And we're gonna talk about it from a standpoint of the gallbladder. Uh, if we take a look at the gallbladder itself here, if we look at the body, it's in the lime green, it's a small part of our abdominal cavity. But being a small part of our abdominal cavity is guess what? It hides itself underneath the liver. So there in green, it has a major function and as you can see here, there is actually, if the gallbladder actually has a problem, it's very common to have a gallstone, which can lead to some surgeries and everything like that. But that being said, what I want you to think about is, I look at the gallbladder a little bit more like a aspect of life. So Travis, come back to me on this, okay? Um, it's an organ that is sometimes misunderstood. Um, there's some things said about it that uh, I believe that a profession um, we'll never understand. I believe that it's actually looked at in such a way that we devalue what it is. Because if you were to just ask a doc, ask anybody, even a natural practitioner, even um, the average person, you know, is a gallbladder essential for life? And most people say no. And I have a different perspective on that. Because when you look at the gallbladder, if I was a gallbladder, I'd be upset at most doctors because they say this. It's the storage unit for bile. I had a question that came back that said, Doc, you talk about the gallbladder, we talk about uh, um, bile and its release and things like that. 
and you say if you had your gallbladder take ox bile because you need it because you had your gallbladder released, but the gallbladder doesn't produce bile. No, it doesn't. See, for example, the liver produces your bile, which now goes to the gallbladder, and it sits there. See, I won't say store, because here's why. Because it goes there, it sits there, it's released when, there, when it's needed, when it, when it knows that there's fat coming through the small intestine, and then it's released there, so it can now emulsify and break down the fat, so we can have good fatty acids to do everything from our brain health to every, health, to every cell, cell tissue of the body. But here's what happens. If I was the gallbladder, I'd be very upset that it's misunderstood. What do you mean? The gallbladder is not a storage unit. It's a sensory organ. It understands. Actually, the liver has no idea when to release, and it doesn't sense when there is actually fat coming through the small intestine. So when I look at the gallbladder, I look and go, my goodness, it's a very sensitive, it's a sensory organ that understands certain parts of the intestinal function that the liver has no idea about. Yet, no, the liver is the workhorse that produces the bile and actually gives it and sits in the gallbladder. And now what it does, the gallbladder is like, okay, my job is to understand when this comes down, I got to release, emulsify those fats, it's a great day. So when people say it's not essential for life, well, let's do this. If it's not essential for life, then why is it the number one surgery still over the last eight years? Do you understand? It's by far the number one surgery. Number two, one of the side effects that can happen from not having a gallbladder is anal leakage. Anal leakage. That means it's all of a sudden you could rectally feel some things come out. And it's more in a fatty acid kind of way. Okay? If one of the major problems not having a gallbladder can be depression, anxiety, degeneration, hormone problems. How? Because it doesn't mean that you don't produce bile from the liver, but you can eat something. You can eat the best fatty acid based food on the planet, but it's always not what you eat, it's what you absorb. And there's no sensory organ, not storage unit. There's no sensory organ that says, ha, here it is. Now I know exactly what to do with the exact timing to release the bile that the liver gave me to hold on to, to sit there. And now all those great fats that are used for hormones, for your brain, for all the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, K, and E, that are essential for the eyes and essential for the skin and essential for everything. That's why gallbladder surgeries can affect the eyes, affect the skin, affect the immune system. But don't worry. It's just a gallbladder. Rip it out. See, it's so misunderstood because it may store, as most people say, bile. But its major aspect of life is it understands what needs to be done at the appropriate time in the appropriate manner. Because as your liver produces bile, it's got to get rid of it. So what it'll do is just flood into the intestinal tract, but there's no food there. If there's a little fat there, bile's like a slip inside. And it can slip inside right out your rectum and cause some anal leakage. See, it's quite interesting. Being misunderstood in all areas of life, actually they could think that you're not essential, that you can live life without it. I wouldn't want to live without my gallbladder. Because you know why? That's why all of a sudden when I say, take ox bile, take our gallbladder complex with it. Because you know why? At least I have some bile in the food I'm eating because they took away the organ that actually would be appropriate that now when there's fatty acids in my system, to emulsify them to absorb them. And I always said, the perspective of the doctors, they don't even share that with people when it comes to uh, their gallbladder removal. And I'm not joking. I've actually looked at some people's diagnostics and said, you need to have your gallbladder out. But before you do understand, they remove that major sensory organ that you now don't have appropriate uh, emulsification bile at the appropriate time. So you have to take something every time you eat for the rest of your life. Every day, every day, and then every time you eat something that has a fat in it, which most things do. See, so something that is not understood well because they have the wrong perspective can lead to devastating things health-wise 
and even something as devastating and actually kind of as funny as anal leakage. But it's not funny to the people that actually suffer from it. See, so when I give you a perspective, they may think that the wellness way care or us as doctors or practitioners or perspective is not needed. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, well, I was going to say something sassy, but I'll bite my tongue. <laughs> Ain't related to anal leakage. But anyways, <laughs> but the idea is this, is it is. The perspective that we put out is affecting people all over the world because you know why? Because I will never look at the gallbladder and downplay its role. And if it's so downplayed and wasn't needed, why do all these major health conditions can actually stem from actually removing it because you have just improper timing because there's no sensory understanding of when fat is in the system. See, every organ is essential, from your appendix to your liver to your gallbladder to the smallest organ that's needed. And I want you guys to understand that. And that's why I have such a fascination and appreciation for the human body. That's why I have such a fascination and appreciation of the female body due to the fact the complexity compared to just having testosterone produced by our testicles, compared to what it takes just even for hormones like estrogens to be produced or progesterones, or how stress affects their body. I want to tell you guys, that's the kind of practitioner you need in your life. So I'm blessed and now we have amazing, obsessed, you know, people with this, but then adding people like Dr. Colin Lena, Dr. Patrick, Dr. Jane, Dr. Carolyn, everybody. And then having the people that we have around that really make this company and also people's lives a lot better. So people say, how do you build a company that we did? All that wrapped up in a one. Because I will never let my doctors or interns realize that the gallbladder is not only misunderstood, but they're misleading to you and they're lying to you. And if you don't understand that, one day it could be your gallbladder removed. And guess what happens? I want, I want to see the last time, because I know some of you probably had your gallbladder removed, that the doctor said, so listen, if we, don't do it, if we don't have a different perspective, and maybe we could save the gallbladder, and maybe we could do something about it, because any leakage could be in your life for the rest of your life if we do this. I guarantee that has never been said to any patient that had their gallbladder removed. That's my last 10%. All right, guys, you guys have a beautiful Saturday. Enjoy it. It's kind of funny because it's August. Something special happens in August. My birthday's coming up soon. It was the 15th, oh my goodness. 15th, I'll be 48 years old. 48 years old, high levels of testosterone, drives seven days a week. And I mean drives mentally seven days a week, prepares seven days a week to bring not only the wellness way to the world, but this awesome show every single week. Thank you guys for watching. Our stats are incredible. Um, people from all over the world are watching even right now. I deeply appreciate every single time. God bless, have a great day. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. Each week on A Different Perspective, we bring you the most cutting edge information on health you won't find anywhere else. For more information on this topic, please visit our website, a Different Perspective offers life-changing information and resources to share and explore. A Different Perspective is leading a health revolution.